All right, to start part two of our discussion here, I want to just remind you what happened here. We have the Helvetians are uh, concerned that there's all this instability here and they want to get the heck out of Dodge. So they try to go over here. Caesar says, no, you can't, and puts the Helvetians back into place. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> one detail that I intentionally left out, and it, so I'm going to bring it up now, is that all of this instability was caused by the Sequani defeating the Aedui, and I told you that. And what I didn't tell you is that the Sequani were aided by a guy named Ariovistus, and he's of another tribe called the Suebi. And so after the Helvetians are told to go home and Caesar kind of declares his dominance over Gaul, all of these Gallic leaders come to him and kind of pledge their loyalty and fealty to him. But secretly they come to him and one by one they all say, you know what, we're really worried about this guy. We're really worried about Ariovistus. Um, he's a wild card and he is bringing Germans over the Rhine River. So here's the Suebi, remember that's the tribe that Ariovis has come in. He's bringing the Germans over the Rhine River. And uh, to the Gauls, just like to the Romans, the Germans are the boogeymen. They're, nothing good ever happens with Germans involved. Um, they, they kill and maim and slaughter. And so this is of grave concern um, to, I think, everybody. So the basic idea here is that Caesar says, okay, well, we got to deal with this. So he goes to Ariovistus, and Ariovistus comes to him, and there is a, a huge battle, um, and he defeats Ariovistus. Um, he, forces the, he forces the Germans to go back across the Rhine, and um, before the battle, I think that it's important to note that all the Romans in the camps, all the Roman troops are getting really freaked out and they're talking about mutiny because they don't want to fight these Germans. Caesar hears about this, calls them all together, and says, tomorrow I'm going to go out and I'm going to fight Ariovistus and those Germans. And you, it's up to you if you come with me. So sure enough, next day he goes out, all of his troops come with him. So it's one of these kind of watershed moments for Caesar and his troops um, in, in this, this unconquered Gallic province uh, and all of this unconquered territory, especially, especially up here. So to kind of recap here, we've, we've got this situation that Caesar dealt with, and then we've got um, this situation with the Germans that, uh, that we're dealing with. So, of course, we're going to probably have to go over here, right? Um, and that's exactly what help what happens here. The, the Belgic tribes that are all here start revolting. And um, Caesar kind of scares them all into submission except the Nervi. And there's a really fierce battle um, that Caesar really glorifies in his commentaries. Um, and uh, essentially he, um, he, he conquers these guys and... Um, declares a universal peace. You know, he's, sac he's, he's pacified this area, pacified this area, and now he's pacified this area. And he declares a universal peace um, in, uh, in all of Gaul. And so then he says, okay, if anybody makes any more trouble, you're ruining the peace, and it's an act of war, and I'm going to come get you. Um, and so we have... Uh, maybe, maybe you can even figure out what's going to happen next. We got this part, this part and this part and um, you can imagine that there's this part over here that might give Caesar some trouble too but before that happens uh, he, he um, gives word back to the Senate that he has pacified all of Gaul and the Senate passes what's called a supplicatio which is like a kind of a holiday um, in, in Caesar's honor and it's 15 days long which is unheard of um, this is unprecedented and so um, that's, you know, just, just one more feather in Caesar's cap here. So while we're talking about Rome, let me, let me say a couple other things. Back in Rome, it's, it's not going well. <laughs> there's a, a massive grain shortage and there's a massive amount of unrest here. And so the political climate is, is really volatile. Um, 
Clodius is an idol now, and he has sort of turned against Pompey. And uh, Pompey, remember the member, the, the one of the other uh, triumvirate, right? Pompey and Crassus are the, the triumvirate with Caesar. Um, so Pompey doesn't have an ally in Rome anymore, and he is, well, he's got one in Crassus, but he's, he's becoming very unpopular, and he, he just cannot, um, he can't do anything um, because of his lack of, uh, of popularity. Um, let's see here. Caesar sees the writing on the wall that when his consulship in Gaul, or his proconsulship in Gaul is up, that he is going to be a private citizen again. And when he becomes a private citizen, he is going to be put on trial for a slew of charges, all very legitimate. And he'll never have a future in Roman politics again or in Rome. So he, may, he, he, he manages to get everybody together, Pompey and Crassus, and renew their agreement, their triumvirate, and he gets Pompey and Crassus to become consuls in 55, and he gets uh, uh, another five-year uh, provincial command of Gaul. And this, um, he, he also kind of, as part of this, he, he gets uh, Cicero to kind of behave um, and... Um, and Clodius actually to, to behave with, with Pompey. But this shows everybody that the Caesar is the one in control. Um, and, and so again, the, the unrest at Rome persists, but also more importantly, this idea that Pompey is Caesar's lackey and he doesn't actually have really any power himself is a really, really big idea. Uh, so let's go back to, let's go back to Gaul for a second. Um, in 56, number Caesar's been here since 58. This is entering into his uh, third year here. Well, remember I told you the uprising, right? Well, we conquered this area, conquered this area, conquered this area. Now we got this area. Um, the Veneti uprise, uh, or, or revolt. Um, Caesar goes and he meets him. It's a, a, a big sea battle, actually. And uh, he, um, he kind of makes an example here. I think he's getting a little tired of having to conquer and reconquer people. So he, he slaughters the Veneti, and he kills most of their Senate, and he sells the rest off into slavery as kind of an example to all of the rest of Gaul. Um, and at the same time, Crassus is uh, kind of put in charge uh, of subjugating the Aquitani, this area. So you can see that Caesar's got this area, and then his buddy kind of rounds it out down here. So going back to Rome, 55, Triumvirate, Pompey, Crassus, Caesar, very unpopular. Well, maybe Pompey and Crassus very unpopular. Caesar's got the military victory and the money that he's sending back to Rome the whole time. Uh, and it's just chaos. It's, it's mob rule. Um, we have the consulship up for election, and Pompey and Crassus are, are intending to win this consulship. And because of the mob violence, what they do is they intimidate and bribe all of the other people up for election into not running. And this works with everybody except for a guy named Domitius. Um, Domitius refuses to be intimidated. He makes it all the way to the day of the election until one of his supporters is killed, murdered by these hired thugs in the campus Martius. And he says, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm out. And so Pompey and Crassus uh, become the new consuls for 55. So the, the power of the triumvirate continues. Um, first thing they do is they try to get a law passed to, uh, to allow them as consuls to levy as many troops as they need to establish peace in the city. And you can imagine this is you know, universal control, military control over the entire city, and this would not go over well with their, um, with their opponents. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what happens here. Well, more violence breaks out. Cato is arrested. Um, four men are murdered in, in, a, in a riot in the Forum. And uh, Crassus even punches another senator in the face. Uh, long story short, measure passes, and uh, Pompey and Crassus are, are in office. 
Um, back to Gaul. We got the Usipites and the Tencteri. They're up here by the Germans. And so Caesar gets word that they're rising up against Roman rule. He goes over there quickly, violently, slaughters the two tribes. Um, and uh, we get the sense that he's, he's getting impatient after having to keep going back to places to, to quell violence. Um, he also decides to cross the Rhine River and make a statement to the Germans. So he, he, he builds a bridge in, in uh, 10 days, marches across, burns a village, stays 18 days, and marches right back and burns that bridge. He's not done, though. He's up there. He might as well take advantage. And there's this province, there's this land up here that has never been seen before by the Romans, and it's called Britannia. And he says, you know what? I'm up here. I'm, I'm, go I'm going. Uh, he decides a very rash, very, um, well, maybe ill-prepared uh, crossing of the strait here into British, the, into Britannia. Uh, and this does not go well. Um, he loses a lot of ships, and they barely basically make it over to Britain. They're attacked by the, the British tribes here, um, and, who surely have heard about what's been going on here. And um, they basically just sort of stay for as much time as maybe you know, they can say, well, we've, we've been here, and uh, they go back and send Caesar sends his army back to Rome, or back to, back to Gaul. And maybe you're getting the sense here, but the Senate is starting to turn against him. They, they offer him, or they give him a 20-day supplicatio this time, but they're starting to question what he's doing. Why are you going across the Rhine and, and provoking these guys? Why are you crossing into to Britain? This wasn't even your territory. Why are you doing these things? So they're starting to, uh, things are starting to maybe break down a little bit. And that includes really the entire political machinery of, of Rome. And so we'll, we'll start with that in part three.